This is the here and now. I'm Dr. Abraham Weisfeld. And uh, perhaps I should give some uh, credibility to my credentials. I did my uh, PhD thesis at the University de Quebec Montréal. Um, it's entitled Nation, Society, and the State. Subtitle is The Reconciliation of Palestinian and Jewish Nationhood. Established a uh, concept of nationhood, which is independent of the state. That was proved in the thesis, and then the subsequent uh, book, which is an elaboration and application of the thesis to the uh, Palestine condition, is the uh, book uh, called The Federation of Palestinian and he Hebrew Nations. So there's no Israel involved as a state. There is no state involved. It is um, a federation that's being proposed based upon the, the organizational principle uh, promoted by the Bund called a national cultural autonomy, in which each nation would have their own national cultural autonomy, uh, comprising uh, governmental institution, police uh, security, uh, educational institutions, religious institutions, uh, all in a uh, state of autonomy in each uh, nation um, benefiting by such uh, by such a right. Now, to um, deal with the current context, and the current context is a continuing genocide by the Zionist regime against the uh, Palestinians of Gaza, who are now collected in Rafah. There's about uh, 350,000 who are still living in the north, but without food and uh, shelter or electricity or water and there's some um, aid being dropped by jordan in the sea off of the coast to which uh, young palestinian swimmers go out to retrieve uh, at the crossing points in the north there is a uh, zionist fanatics who are blocking the transports from entering into gaza to, to uh, bring in the aid as ordered by the security council of the united nations in the south, in uh, Rafa at uh, Beit Hanun, the uh, border police or the Zionist military are delaying the entry of uh, the 500 trucks that are waiting to get into Gaza at the Rafa crossing. They're only allowing in about 85 a day, which is a trickle. And compared to what was being allowed in previously, it is at about a fifth of what is which was allowed previously as well. That is the current context. Of course, there was the uh, massacre of the Palestinian young men who came to retrieve of aid to bring back to their neighborhoods a sack of flour, and they were shot down. Uh, 112 were killed and 720 were injured. Now, the, um, the Zionist military media is trying to portray this as a self-inflicted wound, by the Palestinians themselves who who were trampling upon each other. But, uh, you know, the hospitals have indicated that 80% of the injuries are caused by bullets. And uh, guess who has the bullets? So uh, that uh, another lie is discounted by, uh, by direct testimony of the hospitals. And um, now the... Uh, even the American administration is admitting that the hospital figures of the number of Palestinian deaths is credible and is referring to 25,000 when actually it's uh, at least 30,000 plus those who are still buried. So we can talk about 30, 35,000, 40,000 plus 70,000 to 100,000 who are injured. So, and this uh, campaign is continuing as such inflicting and deaths and uh, disabilities upon the Palestinians uh, in an effort to convince them to flee to Egypt. But Egypt is not having any of that because they would not be able to cope with uh, 2 million Palestinian refugees who are militants, all militants now. And that would be the end of their regime in Egypt, obviously. So now the... Uh, Alternative to Egypt that has been proposed by the Zionist uh, military is that they, the refugees of Rafah should go back to the north, to the dis destroyed north, as they call it, 
without allowing the aid, you know, to enter into the North Gaza regions as well. So it's not much of an alternative that's being proposed there. Now, if they do uh, try to enter into the Rafa area and, and try to capture all the the uh, uh, young men in order to uh, segregate them into uh, basically a concentration camp somewhere, somehow, and then leave the rest of the population undefended. Well, let me tell you something. This was the practice in uh, 1982 in Lebanon when the General Sharon of the uh, Zionist military went in there and occupied Beirut. And in, uh, and uh, in order to avoid a, a big military battle with the uh, 5,000 uh, Fatah soldiers who were there at the time, they made a deal in which, you know, they would allow the Palestinian leadership, including Yasser Arafat, Abu Amar, and the 5,000 Fatah fighters to go to uh, exile in Tunisia, in Tunis. So they agreed to that. They left on boats. And uh, the United States was supposed to guarantee the security of the Palestinian refugees camp, uh, refugees in the camps of Sabr Shatila and near Beirut. And what happened is that uh, the United States just stood by while the uh, Zionist military surrounded the camps and allowed the uh, fascist uh, uh, Lebanese militia of crusaders, basically, called um, Phalanges, to enter into the camp and carry out a massacre using knives in silence for three days in which 3,000 Palestinians were killed. Not all were killed inside the camp. The men who were separated and taken out of the camp into an athletic stadium uh, a little ways away were also killed, massacred. Uh, and probably that uh, massacre took place by the um, Zionist military, but it's not been admitted as such. Now, all of this has been documented in my book called uh, Sabr Shatila, which is available everywhere on Amazon, etc., on libraries. And it was this deposited with the International Court of uh, Criminal Court as a testimony to the uh, the uh, uh, criminal individuals who were responsible from the Zionist military for that massacre, but they didn't do anything about it. Now that material is available as a precedent showing that the Zionist military is uh, has a propensity to commit massacres and is uh, genocidal in intent and in practice. Now, the book, The Federation of Palestinian and Hebrew Nations, is also available on Amazon, although the publisher Westwood Publishers of Atlanta, Georgia, are censoring a second book that is supposed to come out called The Manual of Revolution, book one. So I hope the first book, the Federation book, is still available in spite of the publishers. Now, tomorrow I will be continuing the Jewish Bund Vigil at the Jewish Community Campus in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And uh, we have the big banner there saying, no à l'occupation, no to the occupation. And now it is also an occupation, not only the West Bank, but of the uh, Gaza as well, an internal occupation and not just a siege, you know, by occupation externally. Now, the reaction of, of the Jewish community, you know, at the vigil is changing. At first, it was quite hostile, and there were quite a number of uh, Zionist fanatics who were expressing their hatred in one way or in, uh, another, and some were actually coming to attack the banner or myself. And that has happened three or four times. And there was one Christian woman who did so as well as the Jewish Zionists. But otherwise, the banner is quite visible and is being seen by the uh, traffic uh, in both directions to the uh, number of about uh, 2,400 viewers per hour. And uh, uh, usually the vigil continues for three hours at a time. Uh, that's about the maximum time that one can stay out in the cold, you know, which it has been for the last three or four uh, vigils on Sunday to the degree of uh, minus 12 degrees cent centigrade, which is about 10 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So that can be tolerated only with the best equipment for about three hours. So three times 2,400 is a nice figure. And uh, of course, not everybody looks, you know, but I think everybody sees, you know, that there's a protest happening. You know, some people are very stiff necked. Most people, most people are rather stiff necked and uh, don't want to acknowledge that um, they recognize and understand, you know, what the banner is saying. Otherwise, there are many people 
and um, mothers with their children going to the Jewish community campus for various child activities <clears throat> during the day on Sunday. And uh, many are uh, Hasidim, and I speak to them in Yiddish and say, Nishtof Inzernuma, which means not in our name, which was the original uh, slogan which I developed here, uh, which is uh, part of the uh, placard, which is upstairs there. Oh, you can't see it. Uh, let's see now if I can unfuzz the background. There. Not in our name, but it's in reverse. Oh, sorry. No. There we are. We're back here. So that placard was uh, from 2006 when we started the uh, United Jewish Opposition here in Montreal. And it became quite popular. Another slogan that has uh, been picked up elsewhere, particularly in New York, is uh, one Holocaust does not justify another. So in arguing with the Zionists, you know, who say, well, it's not a Holocaust. And I say, well, it's a genocide that's continuing, you know, so eventually it becomes a Holocaust, doesn't it? And it does continue, even uh, though the uh, Security Council has ordered Israel to allow aid to come into Gaza, but the aid is not being allowed in any sufficient uh, quantity. And uh, a minimalist amount of aid is uh, being allowed in 85 transports a day uh, in order to uh, claim that uh, they're complying with the uh, Security Council order, but that is not the case. Now, The other news uh, of this week is that George Galloway, a former Labour Party member of, of the uh, Parliament of the House of Commons in England, has been re-elected to the House of Commons, but under the uh, party called the Workers' Party and not the Labour Party. The Labour Party has destroyed itself. And uh, the expulsion of the anti-Zionists, particularly the Jewish anti-Zionists from the Labour Party in, uh, in an effort to support uh, the Zionist regime has failed. That's what George Galloway has proven here. Now, there's going to be another general election in England later on in a few months, and presumably George Galloway will be elected again, and the Workers' Party will take a significant chunk out of the Labour Party votes, which may mean that they would lose a predicted win for the Labour Party. The Labour Party is uh, uh, presumed, you know, to be set up, you know, to win the next election, but uh, considering the scandal of their support for the Zionist regime and the genocide in Gaza and the refusal to call for a ceasefire, the refusal to cease supplying the Zionist regime with military equipment, etc., and giving moral support to the genocide is going to disqualify the Labour Party from being one, the Labour Party, two, being a social democratic party, three, being a member of the Second International, which they should be expelled from, and for being a potential government, all that is going to be cancelled. And George Galloway is going to be a prominent figure in the Workers' Party, which perhaps will have a, a general slate, which will eat away at the uh, votes of the Labour Party, which it deserves. And eventually the, the Workers' Party is going to become uh, the new uh, the working class party, and it will take the government, and presumably it is a party of some revolutionary intent, which will uh, uh, um, initiate a general revolutionary process, which will uh, end in a successful revolutionary process in a first world country, in the first world <laughs> imperial regime, which is allied to the United States of America in the Anglo-Saxon international bloc, which uh, for, previously was called the Commonwealth of Nations, but is no longer uh, doted with such uh, such grandeur, and is uh, and now called the Five Eyes, the, um, meaning that the intelligence services of all these countries have now been integrated into a Western bloc, uh, together with uh, NATO, and uh, 
seeking to uh, exert its control over Ukraine, which is now losing, and in the Western Orient with uh, Israel as a uh, land-based uh, military outpost for NATO, and in particular the United States of America, which has military personnel which is participating in this war on Gaza, which is why <clears throat> the protester Aaron uh, Bushnell uh, killed himself in protest as a protest to demonstrate how seriously he, he was protesting and objecting to the genocide in Gaza. <clears throat> Excuse me a moment. Now, the polls have indicated that 50% of the Jewish Americans are for, in favor of a ceasefire, which means that they're opposed to the uh, Zionism, basically. They're opposed to the Zionist regime and its occupation, as opposed to the occupation. So 50% is the new uh, level of opposition, Jewish opposition, whereas in previous years it was stuck at 20%. No, 20% to 50% in a couple of years, perhaps in just in this year alone, perhaps just since October the 7th, is a magnificent uh, advance of the Jewish opposition. And it will advance further now with the uh, decision of the International Court of Justice, <laughs> referring to the plausible genocide. Plausible you know, two Americans, you know, should be translated, you know, because they probably doesn't know, don't know what the word means, you know. If they did, they would, you know, take it more seriously because plausible means likely. So a likely genocide, you know, like for most people means genocide, except for Zionists who say that uh, the genocide has not yet been declared as such, even though it could not be declared as such because the, uh, the, <clears throat> the uh, minutiae, the process of, deciding whether or not it is a genocide is yet to come. And will take a couple of years uh, in order to uh, uh, plow through. Because each side has to provide its, its detailed proof and defense of the charge. So the International Court of Justice did the best that it could, you know, under the uh, procedures of, uh, of the court. Judicial procedure uh, allows for such a designation. The designation has been announced it is a plausible genocide and it should be regarded as such and should be respected as such of course israel doesn't respect international law the uh lawyer uh, for the arab league you know in the submissions for the current case concerning the uh, charge of uh illegal occupation by the zionist regime which is a new case before the international court of justice as well that lawyer on behalf of the uh, arab league mentioned that israel is claiming in effect what is called in Latin lex specialisi, which means a special law. You know, Israel has some kind of a special law. Why? Because Israel is supposed to be representing the Jewish people, which have been subjected to a Holocaust, and therefore Jewish people deserve particular protection against any uh, uh, any racist uh, attacks against the Jewish people. But what has been lacking in the legal proceedings and what has been lacking in the lawyers on behalf of South Africa and on behalf of the Arab League, on behalf of all the countries which are intervening to condemn the Zionist regime, is that they have not disputed the Zionist claim that Israel is speaking on behalf of the Jewish people, that Israel is a Jewish state, which is a fabrication. It is not a Jewish state for various reasons. Okay? One, Israel is not a Jewish state because it doesn't represent a majority of the Jewish people. The majority of the Jewish people do not live in Israel. There's 7.2 million Jewish Israelis. But in the United States of America, there are 7.4 Jewish Americans. Right then and there, you know, there's more Jewish Americans than there are Jewish Israelis. Plus there's 400,000 Jewish Canadians. Plus there's Jewish Canadians, uh, Jewish Argentinians, Jewish Peruvians, Jewish Chileans and uh, Jewish Russians in Russia, uh, Jewish Iranians in Iran, you know, like a Jewish uh, 
Israelis in Berlin, you know, then there's the Israelis who have left, you know, gone to Berlin or to California. So it's estimated there's about a million Israelis who have left Israel. <clears throat> okay, so that means there are 6.2 Jewish Israelis living in Israel who are represented by the Israeli government uh, directly. Uh, I mean, the Jewish Israelis, you know, uh, do have a vote uh, in uh, abstentia. They can go and vote at the Israel uh, consulates or embassies. Uh, but uh, the majority of the Jewish people who don't live in Israel or who do not have Israeli citizenship do not have a vote. <laughs> you know, even though the uh, Zionist regime <clears throat> speaks as if they do. And they talk as if Jewish uh, uh, Jewish uh, people in the diaspora internationally <clears throat> are supporting whatever, you know, the... The Zionist government says, and that's the way they talk, that's the way they act, and that's what they claim. But it is not true. That's number one. Uh, well, that's number two, actually, because number one is that uh, there's more Jewish people who live outside of Israel than live inside of Israel. Two is that the Jewish, is, uh, Jewish people who live outside of Israel do not have a vote in Israeli elections and therefore are not represented by the uh, Israeli governments two that's two uh number three uh is uh <clears throat> in uh, judaism israel does not represent the jewish people either because as is said in hebrew and as comrade net uh, has announced hamadinat ye lo yisrael the state is not israel how does that make sense because Israel was first designated as the name of the Jewish people. And Jacob, you know, was named Israel. Uh, and Jacob uh, was the father of the 12 uh, sons who became the 12 tribes of the Jewish people. And uh, this is, you know, before there was ever a, a state called Israel. And even when a state called Israel was established, it uh, failed. Because, uh, you know, there was a king who began to implement, you know, a taxation uh, in order to um, wage, you know, war, in order to build up a military. And this was rejected by the northern Israelites, who formed a, a territory called Sumeria. And uh, the Sumerians uh, still live there at, on Mount Gerizim uh, in Nablus. And... Uh, this uh, split away from the state called Israel and from the kings that ruled it. <clears throat> so where uh, is this found in Judaism? I'll tell you. The prophet Samuel, who was the judge of Israel, basically, you know, the uh, leader of the civil society and to whom, you know, the Israel Israelites <clears throat> came to for judgments and for leadership, uh, at which time, you know, the Israelites were living together with the Edomites, with the Moabites, with the Amorites, with the Jebusites, all of the nations that lived in Canaan. So they were living in Canaan. <clears throat> and they were called Israelites, you know, because they were the Jewish people who were called Israel, okay? The Jewish people who were founded by Moses, uh, Musa, Moshe, in, in, in Yiddish and Hebrew. And of course, this Jewish people established by uh, Moshe was established 400 years after Abraham had uh, lived and was welcomed into the land of Canaan. Now, if we go back to the uh, the announced, you know, covenant of Abraham for the land, we find that it says the following, that the descendants of Abraham are to be welcomed in the land of Canaan forever. Obviously, it refers to the land of Canaan, not to Israel. Number one. Two, it is uh, a sign of welcome, like walana uh, salam in Arabic, which is a traditional greeting, which means you are welcome here. Now, the translation into English says that it is to be the possession. Canaan was to be the possession of Abraham and his descendants, but that can't be. You know, uh, the correct translation or is an ambiguous translation because when Abraham was looking for a, a, a land, uh, a piece of land, a plot to bury his uh, first wife, Sarah, at the, uh, and he 
uh, did so in a plot of land that included the uh, cave of Melpatak, uh, which is now the uh, the uh, mosque and synagogue of Abraham, Ibrahimi Mosque, and the synagogue of Abraham. Uh, that land was paid for with 400 pieces of silver from Abraham. So it wasn't taken by force. It wasn't given for nothing. You know, the land was not, you know, like handed over, you know, to Abraham and his descendants, you know, by the deity. No way. It was announced as a, a pact to be guarded in respect to the other nations of Canaan as well. And it was accepted by the other nations of Canaan. In fact, the grandmother of uh, King David happened to be uh, a Moabite who became Jewish as well, but she nonetheless, of course, remained Moabite. And so did David. And in the kingdom of Solomon, the court of Solomon, there were many Moabites, and uh, not all the wives were from the Israelites and from the uh, one tribe or another of Jacob. No, they were from the various nationalities that comprise, you know, the civil society of Canaan. And of course, the descendants of Solomon would be considered both Israelites and uh, Moabites or Edomites. And there's, uh, you know, no doubt that uh, this uh, land of Canaan, which subsequently became occupied by a whole series of empires, nonetheless was a society. And when the Zionists claim that there was no such thing as uh, Palestine, they mean that there was no such thing as an independent Palestine because it was under mandate, the British mandate. And before that, it was a province of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, before that, it was part of a province of the Assyrian Empire. And before that, it was a, a province of the Egyptian Empire. <laughs> yeah, but it was always there. And in fact, that's where the alphabet, you know, was conceived of. You know, it wasn't imported into Canaan. It was developed by the Canaans, Canaanites. And I'll tell you how. You know, uh, the Zionists will tell you that the, the alphabet uh, came from Aleph base, came from the Hebrew alphabet. But no, the Hebrew alphabet came from the Canaanite alphabet, which was developed in the following manner. There was a mine for uh, turquoise. Uh, which was uh, one of the enterprises conducted by Egypt. And Egypt used the uh, the turquoise to make its amulets, you know, and all the beautiful jewelry that the pharaohs wore. Okay. Now, the workers of the turquoise mine uh, were very jealous of the Egyptians because every, you know, there was one day of the year in which the Egyptians would have a celebration. And they would have a celebration for the uh, the deity that they called the deity of turquoise. Now, of course, all of these deities were later incorporated all together in the common deity described by Judaism, which was adopted by both Christianity at first in Eastern Christianity, and then by Islam as a unified God, representing all the various gods that the various nations of the world, you know, had referred to by the various names. Now, the... Uh, uh, turquoise uh, miners, uh, you know, were jealous, you know, of the Egyptians, you know, having their own ceremony and having a monument that they set up, you know, with hieroglyphics uh, announcing the name of the uh, turquoise goddess. So what did they do? They made up their own name for the uh, goddess of turquoise. And they wrote it on a monument using their own symbols. And how did they develop symbols to describe, you know, this name of the goddess of turquoise? Well, uh, you know, the, the hieroglyphics were much too complicated, you know, for the uneducated turquoise workers, okay? Consider that there's like 3,000 hieroglyphics that you have to memorize in order to be able to read, in order to be able to write. Okay, that's well, possible. But for the turquoise workers, that was just too much. To bear. So they uh, took the sound of the name that they were ascribing to the goddess of turquoise 
in their own language, in the Canaanite language. And they looked for symbols that would represent the sound. Now, the first letter that they thought of was a letter that sounded like the name given to oxen. And this was started with a, an A. Ah. So they took the uh, image of an ox and called it A. Ah. And this became Aleph. Now, the way in which the symbol looked was like an ox's head with a, a pointed chin and with two corns, horns. And this symbol was turned around so that the two horns were standing up right. And it became the letter A. It became the letter Aleph. In the same way, you know, in the Hebrew alph alphabet, you know, it just looks a little different. That's all. It's the same letter. And it was the same sound. And this was used to describe the name of the goddess of turquoise. And then they figured, you know, well, if we can do this, you know, one time, you know, we can do it, you know, like, uh, any number of times. So uh, all the names for which they had words for in the Canaanite language began to be written down using the alphabet. And this was adopted by Hebrew. This was adopted by all the other Canaanite languages. And eventually all of the languages began to merge because they're living together, speaking to each other. And they would share the same words. And the words for which one language did not have a name for, they would adopt from the other language so that they would increase their vocabulary and become a more precise language. And this fusion of Hebrew and the uh, Canaanite languages became the language of the region, became the language of Canaanite. And this language is called Aramaic. And this is the language that was spoken by the ancient Israelites, even under the various kingdoms. And Hebrew was spoken by the Abraham clan, which arrived from Mesopotamia, because that's where Hebrew originated, in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, in this around the city of Ur. So, here we are now at the stage in history in which Aramaic is being spoken in the ancient land of uh, Canaan and uh, Israel and Sumeria. And uh, then what happened? Under the occupation of the Greeks, there was a rebellion. Then under the occupation of the Romans, there was also a rebellion first of all, by the uh, Israelites, but presumably, you know, included the others as well, which is not mentioned anywhere and should be explored. And the Israelites went through various forms of, uh, of transformations. Just to conclude then, because I have to go speak with my lawyer for the case that's coming up on Monday, which is the case in which I'm charged with criminal mischief for having written and a free Palestine on an Israel Day parade poster at the Jewish community campus. And as well, the breeze, uh, breaking condition charge. I have two charges against me now. And uh, we're preparing for that day. But to conclude here, so the... Uh, uh, Israelites and the Canaanites under the various occupations would rebel until finally uh, the, uh, the rebel rebels were exiled. And, uh, and also there were slaves taken by the Roman Empire, uh, 350 of which were taken to uh, Rome in order to work as professionals or as uh, import-export experts. And uh, J Jewish people, these Jewish uh, people, uh, merchants, you know, became quite prominent because they were able to operate on an international level because they would communicate 
with uh, other Jewish people in other countries who, with whom they were able to trade uh, by the use of the Hebrew language. And uh, that's the principal reason, you know, why uh, there were Jewish people in, in that uh, area of commerce and not because, you know, they were particularly greedy. Uh, so, you know, the uh, culture of Canaan has to be respected as such, you know, by the Jewish people. And the Israelites themselves, it should be noted, became differentiated. There were those, you know, who were the uh, slaves and uh, and 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 uh, merchants, you know, who went to uh, the Roman Empire, and uh, who, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, formed families, you know, with uh, converted uh, European women, and thus became the Ashkenazim, which is the Hebrew name for the Germans because the Jewish people moved out of the Roman Empire into the Rhine Valley, where they, there was a significantly greater degree of freedom. And uh, they adopted a German dialect uh, called the, uh, the 14th century German uh, dialect, which became Yiddish uh, as the uh, German working class, as yeah, the German Jewish working class moved to Poland, where they were invited uh, by the king in order to uh, kickstart the economy of Poland. So the uh, Jew, uh, Jewish German uh, middle class remained and became an unusual sort of you know, nationality without much of a working class. And this uh, derailed you know, Karl Marx in his uh, 1848 uh, work on the uh, Jewish question, in which he assumed that uh, Jewish people were merely uh, some middle class phenomena that was uh, a bourgeois phenomena that would disappear and didn't recognize that the Jewish working class continued to exist in Poland. In Poland later on, and in uh, Russia, the, the Jewish working class became ghettoized, of course, until finally it was uh, genocided by the uh, Nazi occupation. So that's, you know, as far as the Jaskinazim are concerned. But the Jewish people also, you know, were uh, exiled to other places in the Arab countries and became the Mizrahim, Arab Jewish populations. And uh, within... Uh, the Canaanite area, which was occupied by the various empires, the Israelites uh, went through various transformations. Because uh, there was a certain degree of corruption amongst the uh, Judaic uh, uh, elite, there were many Jewish people who followed the uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, Christian sect followers of, of uh, Yehoshua ben Yosef, which is called uh, Jesus Christ, you know, by the Greeks because Christ means um, demigod, in which uh, that figure was transformed into some kind of a god and, and developed into another religion under the Roman Empire, which was declared as such you know, by the Roman emperors. And they used it as a justification to uh, um, secure uh, the um, ideological control over civil society. Now, the uh, Jewish uh, uh, Christian sect followers uh, Later on, it became uh, um, under the uh, Ottoman Empire, became Muslims because uh, if you weren't a Muslim, you had to pay a special tax for the dhimmi status. And uh, in order to avoid such a tax, uh, one would convert into being a Muslim. And uh, uh, these uh, Israelites would, of course, you know, bring in their Judaic, you know, uh, conceptions into the Islam that they were adopting and uh, developed a particular form of Islam, which was quite compatible, you know, with Judaism, as demonstrated by the cohabitation of the uh, Jewish Sumerians on Mount Gerizim with the uh, Muslim uh, of Palestinians who live in Nablus to this day. And uh, so we can conclude that a great number of the Israelites had become Palestinian Muslims and were living there as such. And this is related to what is called the Ten Lost Tribes, who were uh, Israelites, uh, Jewish uh, tribes that related, integrated into the uh, adjacent uh, cultures and lived there as Palestinians to a great degree. To what degree, we don't know. What percentage of the Palestinians originated with the Israelites you know, could be determined by various research methods and uh, research into the cultural attributes, you know, of the various communities, but that has not been done. Certainly not by the Zionists, who don't want to, who don't want to know from nothing. 
so that's basically you know the uh the uh, uh matters that i want to bring to your attention which are not uh, known not well known or not known at all and uh should be known in particular you know the uh, uh, intervention of samuel the prophet you know who objected to the um development of a of a state of a kingdom saying that uh a king would uh, merely uh lead you into uh, misadventures and use uh, <clears throat> the uh, taxation to uh, wage war on other peoples, which is not what uh, the Jewish people are about. Uh, but nonetheless, the general population were demanding to be a nation like other nations and demanding a king. And so Solomon actually chose, you know, working class kid to be a, the first king, which was King Saul, who eventually became corrupted and was replaced by King David, who had blood on the hands and was not allowed, you know, to build a temple until uh, King Solomon, who was uh, more of a pacifist and cultural person, and uh, uh, he was allowed to build a temple, which was later destroyed by the by the Romans. And even though the Zionists are searching for any trace of it, no doubt the Romans did a very clean job of eliminating that evidence, that historical evidence. But in any case, you know, it doesn't justify establishing an exclusive Jewish nation state, you know, because it doesn't represent the Jewish people in the first place. and doesn't represent all the nations of the land of Canada. Now, the statement of Solomon can be found in his first book, in the uh, uh, eighth chapter, section six and paragraphs uh five to twenty two yes i remembered it so you go there and you'll find you know what it says that is judaism which is not status which is not in favor of having a king over the jewish people and which is true judaism and which is in contradiction with zionism and i've uh, printed that up and i've handed it out there and the zionists inside the Jewish community campus came out and told the security guard to come out and told, to tell me that I shouldn't be handing out this leaflet because it's not allowed into the Jewish community campus. That is, Judaism is not allowed in the Jewish community campus, according to the Zionists. That's one indication of, you know, just where we are. Okay, I have to go and speak with a lawyer now, who is a great guy, a movement lawyer, you know, is, is, who's called Maître Richard, Richard Beaulieu James. Should be famous. He did a great job and he got me. He's the one who got me out of the prison, you know, when I was in there for four days for having gone back to the Jewish Community Center when they arrested me. So here we go. And I'll, I'll update you on the further, you know, legal proceedings that we're undertaking and uh, tell you of our successes in that domain. Bye for now.